This is the first in a short series of lectures that I plan to put together for chemical reaction engineering. Uh, for those of you just getting started, chemical reaction engineering is uh, the discipline that is really unique to chemical engineering where we uh, take the theory of chemical kinetics and apply it to determine the sizes, uh, catalysts, operating conditions, and even materials that we use to make chemical reactors. Uh, so, the, so the little course is going to start with a discussion of chemical equilibrium. Uh, you can't do kinetics without doing some thermodynamics, and so, so that's where we're going to begin. And, uh, and so we'll start with uh, the definition of the equilibrium constant for a chemical reaction. I'm going to do everything in terms of a generic chemical reaction uh, that's uh, A moles of species A combines with B moles of species B and makes products C moles of species C and D moles of species D. Uh, so in the tables, in a, you might look up the, the heat of formation of each of these, uh, each of these compounds. And maybe you can also get the entropy of formation, or maybe you have a table that lists separately the Gibbs free energy of formation of each of those. Uh, but some way or another, you're going to be able to look up the, uh, the thermodynamic properties of the, of the species involved in your reaction. And that will give you this, this key property, the Gibbs free energy uh, associated with the chemical reaction. Okay, so from that, you can extract an equilibrium constant. We'll say a little bit later about how to obtain this information at the correct temperature. Uh, but, but if you're lucky, you're working at the uh, temperature given in your table, and it's just this exponential factor, e to the minus delta G reaction divided by kT, is the equilibrium constant. Note that the equilibrium constant written this way must be dimensionless. Uh, it is a ratio of activities activity of species C to the power of the stoichiometric coefficient, and all of your products appear in the numerator uh, written in this way, and your reactants appear in the denominator written this way. So, uh, so these are activities. They are, uh, by definition, dimensionless, and so that gives you a uh, dimensionless, dimensionless equilibrium constant. So I want to also point out that this equation is true uh, this equation is true when the species each reach their equilibrium concentrations uh, for this reaction. Okay, so if you just plug in into standard activity expressions the uh, starting non-equilibrium conditions, you will find something that's very different from the exponential of the Gibbs free energy of reaction. So this is commonly known as the law of mass action that was originally put forth by Goldberg and Wage in their famous paper from the 1860s. Uh, their notation for the law of mass action was this strange-looking object. Uh, things have things have gotten bet, somewhat better in terms of notation since then, and uh, and so you won't see things that look like this. So the Haber process is a is a first example. This is a historically very important. This is originally how uh, how the Germans were making uh, making their explosives uh, during World War One. But, uh, but since then, it's become very important in terms of feeding the world's people. And so it's, it's a chemical reaction that combines uh, nitrogen with three parts of hydrogen to give you ammonia. And of course, this is fixed nitrogen. This is something that, that we can use for fertilizers and, and, uh, and hence feeding the world's people. Uh, the equilibrium constant for this reaction is 6.6 .6 times 10 to the minus 3. It's, this appears to be very small. Uh, but notice that you have two things on the left and one thing on the right, so, so it will turn out that this reaction at this temperature can actually move, proceed somewhat to the right. Where does this number come from? Uh, well, remember that you get this number by going to the thermodynamic tables and looking up heat of formation of each of these, each of these reactants and products, and also their entropy of formation. Uh, so we will talk about converting things from one temperature to another in, a, in a, uh, another couple of lectures. Okay, so by definition, the activity of each of these gases involved in this reaction is a ratio of the fugacities. Okay, so we've got a fugacity of gas component I divided by a reference gas component I fugacity. The standard reference fugacity is the fugacity at one atmosphere. Uh, and so, so then you have uh, that our equilibrium constant is uh, the ratio of fugacities, the actual ratio of fugacities. So this is the ammonia fugacity divided by the nitrogen fugacity to the one-half and the hydrogen fugacity to the three-halves. Uh, so this other term, 
is coming from the denominator, uh, or sorry, it's coming from the reference fugacities, and it, uh, it was originally in the denominator, so, so this guy is, uh, appears to be upside down. You've got a reference fugacity of ammonia in the, in the denominator and a, a reference fugacity of ammonia in the numerator, and uh, the reference fugacity of hydrogen to the power of three halves in the, in the numerator there. So all these reference fugacities are just one atmosphere, and so, so that term ends up giving you, so here you've got one atmosphere to the power one half and one atmosphere to the power three halves is one atmosphere squared divided by one atmosphere in the denominator gives you one atmosphere uh, factor in the numerator. Okay, so then, so then this is the actual uh, fugacity ratio for all those species. And remember that this ratio multiplied by one atmosphere must be equal to that equilibrium constant, which comes from standard thermodynamic properties, uh, when the reaction reaches equilibrium. So there are several ways that we could go about evaluating this once we get to this point. Uh, we can convert things to partial pressures, we can convert things to mole fractions, or we can even use concentrations. Uh, the standard way to do things for gases is to use the lewis randall rule, which defines the fugacity of component I as a fugacity coefficient times the ideal partial pressure of component I, which is the mole fraction of component I multiplied by the total pressure of the system. So Xi here is the mole fraction, uh, P is the total pressure, and Phi I is this fugacity coefficient. When we substitute for every one of the species involved in this reaction, this lewis randall expression for the fugacity coefficient into our equilibrium constant expression, then it factors quite naturally into a, uh, a ratio of mole fractions times a ratio of fugacity coefficients times a, uh, a ratio of the total pressure, which is just p to the minus 1 in this case. And notice the p to the minus 1 times 1 atmosphere is going to cancel in terms of its units and give us back something that's appropriately dimensionless. Okay, so if we want to do anything farther than this, we have to actually specify the pressure so that we get a numerical factor out of this quantity here. So let's suppose that the reaction is going to be run at 300 atmospheres. Okay, so this, this reaction is run at high pressure so that you can drive it to the right uh, we will talk about Le Chatelier's rule in a little bit, but you can probably already imagine that uh, that if you increase the pressure and you have two moles going to one, uh, that that will, will drive things to the right. Okay, so the fugacity coefficient for ammonia is 0 0.91 at these conditions. Uh, that's because it's a polar gas uh, and, and it tends to be more dense than would be expected for an ideal gas. The fugacity coefficient for Nitrogen is 1.14. It's a nonpolar gas. Also, the fugacity coefficient for H2 is uh, is 1.09. These are slightly larger than one because uh, because they're nonpolar and they tend to be uh, they tend to be less dense than you would expect them to be at uh, at this pressure of 300 atmospheres. Okay, so uh, notice that this factor. Uh, the fugacity coefficient for nitrogen, or for sorry, for ammonia, divided by that for nitrogen and hydrogen is on the order of one. Okay, so uh, so we could probably make a crude estimate of our equilibrium constant. Recall that our equilibrium constant uh, was this expression. Oh, sorry, uh, was this expression after uh, breaking everything into mole fractions, fugacities, pressures, and the the units term. Uh, so if we left this out we would really only be losing something on the order of one, and we might do a decent job by just ignoring that as a first approximation. So if we include it and we plug in all the numbers uh, for this problem, uh, and then solve for the ratio of mole fractions, we find that the ratio of mole fractions, so let me, let me make sure that everybody's clear on what I've done here. I have taken this equation and solved for this ratio of mole fractions. Uh, that gives you this equation, so the mole fractions are equal to the equilibrium constant times the pressure divided by one atmosphere uh, times this, this uh, inverted ratio of uh, fugacity coefficients. And when you plug in all the numbers that we've just gone through and computed, you get that this is 2.64. Okay, so that's 2.64. It's a dimensionless number because it's just a ratio of mole fractions. Uh, now, to figure out exactly how far the reaction goes to the right, we have to use the stoichiometry of the reaction. Okay, so this example is coming from Davis and Davis. I should point out that many of the notes from this uh, chapter will be coming from Davis and Davis. It's a good textbook and it's free on the web. And uh, so thank you to uh, Davis and Davis for providing this nice resource.
So we can create a little table, and let's suppose that we start uh, with, with N0 moles of nitrogen and M0 moles of hydrogen. As the reaction proceeds to the right, the number of moles of nitrogen will reduce by, uh, by an extent of reaction variable xi. As it proceeds by the same amount, as it turns over in a sense, the same number of times, the number of moles of hydrogen will decrease by three times that extent of reaction xi. And the number of moles of, of ammonia will increase from zero, initially, to two times the extent of reaction xi. So the total number of moles is N0 plus M0 minus two xi. That's, that's minus one minus three plus two is minus two. So from all of this, we have just one variable to determine. This is the advantage of introducing a extent of reaction variable. When we have one reaction, we have one extent of reaction variable, and everything is determined from that. So this is the mole fraction of ammonia. Remember that there were two, uh, there were two xi amounts of ammonia after it reaches equilibrium out of a total number of moles, N0 plus M0 minus two xi. So that's this fraction here in the numerator. We can also express the, uh, the mole fraction of ammonia, or sorry, of nitrogen after it reaches equilibrium. That's N0 minus xi divided by the total amount of material to the power one half. Then we have uh, M0 minus three xi divided by the total to the power three halves. And all of that must be equal to 2.64. So given any value of N0 and M0, we can plot the left-hand side of this equation as a function of xi and look for the point, uh, look for the equilibrium conversion xi uh, at which it crosses the line 2.64. Okay, so this is basically how this calculation would work. And if you plug in numbers, these are the numbers used by Davis and Davis, uh, you have uh, you, ha you start out with 25 moles of nitrogen, 75 moles of hydrogen, that gives you an equilibrium conversion. Uh, sorry, it's an equilibrium uh, extent of reaction of 13.1 moles. Therefore, the uh, equilibrium mole fraction of ammonia uh, after this thing goes to completion is 36%. So you can look at this problem and ask what would happen if we ran this reaction at higher pressure. Uh, well, you can expect that you're taking two moles of gas and converting them into one, and so as the pressure increases, this will, this will help drive the reaction to the right. So we expect this equilibrium mole fraction of ammonia to get larger as the pressure increases. What if you have the equilibrium constant at temperature one, and you want the equilibrium constant at temperature two? There are actually two names for this equation. Uh, one is the Gibbs-Helmholtz equation, and it's, it's written this way. Uh, the other one, that's actually the same equation, is the Van Hoff equation. Uh, these two are exactly the same because delta G naught over RT is minus log of the equilibrium constant. Okay, so, uh, so you, can, you can basically use this equation to change the temperature. Okay, so the first approximation that we can make is to assume that the reactants and the products have the same heat capacity. In that case, as we change the temperature, the enthalpy of reaction remains constant, and uh, we can write then that we can just integrate this Gibbs-Helmholtz equation and get that delta G naught at temperature T2 divided by RT2 is delta G naught at temperature T1 divided by RT1 plus the constant delta H naught divided by R uh, multiplied by the difference in one over T factors. Okay, so, so this is a, a rather easy uh, approximation to use. It's uh, not, not correct as you go to large temperature intervals. You have to be careful with this. You also want to be careful when you have, for example, a uh, solid turning into a, into a gas or something like that. Those heat capacities tend to be quite different in that case, and you want to make sure you account for the heat capacity difference. Okay, so in, if we want to account for that heat capacity difference, then it's, it's probably a little easier to go back and use the, the, the Van Hoff form of this, just by habit, that's, that's what I've always done at least. Uh, so I can write delta H naught divided by R as a function of temperature if I account for the fact that I have one value of, of the enthalpy of reaction at temperature one, and then I account for the, the change in temperature by looking at the difference in heat capacity. So this is the product's heat capacity minus the reactant's heat capacity multiplied by T minus the reference temperature T1. And now you go through and integrate 
this equation, and you find that the log of the equilibrium constant at t2 relative to the equilibrium constant at t1 is this complicated expression. I won't go through and, and, uh, and talk about all the terms here, but I have made those terms that would vanish if we ignored the heat difference in heat capacity. Uh, those terms are all red, right? So you can see that you have a number of, of terms that are quite often small, but sometimes quite important, uh, shown in red here that you would be losing if you ignore the difference in heat capacity between the products and the reactants. So let's do this in pictures, okay? So if you were to try to convert ammonia, or convert nitrogen and hydrogen into ammonia at home, uh, which would probably not be a very safe thing to do, uh, then you might do it in the way that we've described. In pictures, that would look like this. You have a constant pressure reactor. We're going to set the reactor by uh, taking a uh, constant a reactor of cross, constant cross-section, uh, placing a piston on top with some known mass to give us a constant pressure inside of 300 atmospheres, okay? So we're going to start out with 25 moles of nitrogen and 75 moles of hydrogen at 300 Kelvin. The first thing that we're going to do is we're going to heat this reaction up to the temperature that we considered, uh, that is 723 Kelvin. Now what you, what you see has happened so far is that... Um, is that you have basically expanded this gas uh, and the piston moves upward, okay? So now you can wait for something like 20 years, and if you look inside, you might expect to find ammonia, uh, but you won't. What, it, what will happen instead is that you still have 25 moles of nitrogen and 75 moles of hydrogen, okay? So it's still sitting there at 723 Kelvin, and no reaction is happening. Well, what's gone wrong? This reaction doesn't happen spontaneously without a catalyst. Uh, and so catalysis at this point in the course will just be explained as magic, but later we will go through and actually talk about how catalysis works in very simple uh, discussion of some, some basic mechanisms. If you add Haber's iron catalyst at this temperature and you wait for something like an hour, then what will happen is that uh, that piston will start to go down. That is an indication that the number of molecules in the, in the cylinder are decreasing. Uh, and if you look after it reaches equilibrium, you will have 12 moles of nitrogen, 36 moles of hydrogen, and 26 moles of ammonia, and that's what you've produced in this reaction, okay? So the volume shrinks as this reaction continues, and I'll leave you with the question, what would happen if you did this reaction in a constant volume reactor? Would the conversion go as far? Would it go farther, or would it go less far?